This practical session will cover three main points. One is how we can download tracks of many animals directly from movebank.org, which is a repository of uh, geographic data of animal movements. Then we revise how to plot this data with uh, QGIS. And finally, I wanted to uh, show you some uh, analysis that we can do with R. In this case, to calculate something very simple, which is the movement speed of uh, animals. On my computer, I have already opened the main website of movebank.org and I navigate straight away to the map with the trajectories. So in this map you can see an uh, overview of all the data that have been uploaded to MoveBank by different groups of researchers. And some of these data are directly accessible and some of these data need uh, uh, permission from the authors to, uh, to see the content of the data. I'll go straight away to search for the type of data that we are interested, but I invite you to also navigate this group and search for other types of data. Not all of them are free to download it immediately, but some, most of them can be obtained by contacting the authors. So if I search for pigeons and I only check for studies where I can see the data, I can uh, have a list of studies where these data are visible, and today I focus in particular on this one, with leadership in homing pigeons, that I open in the studies page. Uh, here you have some summary of the data set. This is the data set associated with a, an article by Santos and collaborators on uh, leadership in homing pigeons, and you can find information about, about the license, not not much in this case, but you have longitude and latitude, the, the main coordinates for the study, how many animals were tagged, in this case 10 pigeons, how many tags, how many deployments, and so on. Um, you can just download the data, and I'll come to this later on. You can also view the data in the map, directly in MoveBank. Here it zooms on the data set, and we see that this is a, a these are a few uh, trajectories of pigeons. Yeah, as you know, homing pigeons will uh, go back to their home loft when you release them from uh, some distant destination. And in this case, we can imagine that probably this is the position of the loft because we see that when they were released from all these points, they went up uh, to, the, to this position. And I can zoom in a little bit, and uh, if I uh, zoom, uh, sufficiently enough, we can start to see the individual data points. So this is a flock of pigeons and the, the pigeons were flying together. And then I can also do the opposite and zoom out in this case, and we can get an idea of the place where this data set was collected uh, by having a look at the map in the smaller uh, detail. So here is Constance, so the, here is uh, Zurich, and you can uh, get an idea of the geography of where we are. Now I go back to the uh, original data set. Another thing that you can ask, uh, move bank, but you need to log in, which is uh, it's straightforward to get an account, is start an annotation request. So uh, these are the, 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 the data in my data set, and you can pick a few of these animals, or all of them, and ask for an annotation of these uh, tracks. What is an annotation? So there is a lot of information about the surface of Earth that is, uh, comes from, for instance, from satellite images. And so uh, we have information about the surface and vegetation, vegetation cover, land cover, to the activity of, uh, of uh, ecosystems, about human populations, for instance, the population density. For the ocean, we have information about the chemistry, the pressure, the, the, uh, all the characteristics, like the currents. For uh, topography, we have the elevation or bathymetry. In case of weather, we have the local uh, weather conditions in, uh, in terms of wind, temperature, and uh, many other things. 
All these data collected by satellites have uh, some special and temporal resolution that you need to be wary of. And uh, this annotation service will map, uh, interpolate the information that comes from different locations and map it to the coordinates that you have. So you can know uh, the conditions where the animal moves, uh, the type of vegetation, the type of weather that it was uh, on that particular day or time of the year, depending on the temporal resolution that you have. Now, I'm not as asking for annotated data, but I simply download the raw data from the file. Uh, so uh, I ask for a comma separated value file, and I, in this case, I also, uh, so by default, the data set will have the geographical coordinates, latitude and longitude. And today I'm also asking to have the projected coordinates, UTM coordinates, and download it. Save as, and I save on a folder on my desktop that I have already created. So uh, this, this is the first step. I, I downloaded the folder with the data set with, as a CSV file. I saved the CSV file from uh, MoveBank and renamed it to remove some spaces and brackets, which I don't like in file names. The first thing that I wanted to do is to uh, have a look at this file uh, with uh, Excel, for instance. This is a very large data set, and this is often the case if you download all the data from uh, MoveBank. So it will take some time to open. It contains information about multiple flights uh, from uh, 10 pigeons. So you have, uh, let's have a look at the uh, header of this file. So we have an ID for each observation, whether the tag was visible or not, a timestamp here, maybe I zoom in a little bit so, so that it is more visible, maybe too much. A timestamp, location, longitude, 8 degrees, Latitude, 47 degrees, this is Central Europe, so we would expect something in this range. Um, and then there are multiple flights. In this comments column, we have information about which flight we are looking at. Let's have, um, so let's have a look at something else I wanted to focus on. Also, we have this timestamp, which tells us the date and also the hour of the uh, uh, location and we can see that uh, we have the same number of hours, minutes and seconds for four timestamps and then it increases. So every four uh, fixes we have a second, we have a, a temporal resolution of 0 0.25 seconds in this uh, file. And then uh, other information, in this case uh, the file is already calculating uh, the speed, the ground speed, the height above the ellipsoid, the sensor type. Some of this information is repeated all the, throughout the file and maybe we don't need to uh, have it now, but it's useful to, to know that it's accessible. The species of the, of the animal and what is particularly important, the uh, identifier for the tag and for the individual animal which often are the same, but if a certain animal lost its tag and then it was attached a new tag, it, they can be different. And then uh, the name of the study and what we asked, also the projected coordinates, easting and northing. In this case, the projected coordinates refer to the UTM zone 32, which we have seen in the past is a uh, so is the reference zone for this area. Let, let's come to this soon. Uh, you probably remember that all the surface of Earth is divided in 60 UTM zones that are uh, the important part is each column here. Okay, and you can see that 32 is the zone that corresponds to this location in Switzerland where the flight took place. And the coordinates are now in meters, so it, they are very big numbers, not very easy to uh, read, but you can see that between the first and the second fix, there is a distance of about uh, four meters, or four, three meters. 
And here along the, the north-south direction, there is also a distance of a couple of meters. Now, we, we have seen this uh, data set, and what we want to do is open it in uh, uh, QGS. But bef before I open the data set in QGS, I will uh, just uh, exclude some of these flights and keep only one. And now I have opened uh, QGS. This is when I open QGS at this window, and I double click here, and uh, I'm ready to import the coordinates into QGS. So I go to, uh, you don't see my menu here, but I go to layer, add layer, and then add the limited text layer. And I browse here to open the file. Pigeon leadership, I take the only flight five so that it's a little bit smaller. And the, the quickest thing is that with QGIS I can check immediately that each column is well uh, uh, separated from the others, that the data are well organized. For instance, if I, this is a comma separated value, if I had the wrong delimiter in the file, I would see everything appear as a single column which can cause problems, of course. Now, these are projected coordinates, but I also have the geographic coordinate in the long, location launch and location lat, longitude and latitude for the study. And then I have UTM easting and northing. And I could use both of them uh, in QGIS. Let's first start from latitude and longitude. So I need to know which one is X and which one is Y. Uh, as, and this is something easy because if I use latitude and longitude, we often uh, design draw maps with the north and south on the vertical axis and east-west on the horizontal axis. So I can use as x-axis the longitude and as y-axis the latitude. In this case, I'm using the geographic coordinates, so, so uh, the coordinate reference system would be the EPS G4326 WGS84, which is the general one for all the surface of Earth, which I can use. And let's try to add this and close. And I see a set of coordinates appear on the map here. I would like to add a map behind the coordinates. So I create a new connection, for instance, for uh, Google Maps, Google Satellite. I, I actually have one already, but I wanted to show you how we do this. And then you need to find the appropriate address to enter here to, uh, for the connection. And then I create this uh, it's a, it's double with the same name, but I move it here. And you see that I, I see the satellite image. My uh, tracks have disappeared because they are just in the layer that is below the map. So I just drag and drop the layer with the map down so that uh, now the, the, the tracks are visible again. Now the color is not very nice. So I just go to um, the properties for this layer. And uh, I can just change the color or the size of the, of the dots like this. But I can also do some other uh, changes to visualize these uh, colors. So first of all, the, the green maybe is not the best choice. Uh, I'll pick another color. But, uh, yellow. Okay, this is one way to uh, visualize them. And the, the other thing that I can do is that I can uh, make them categorized for different birds. So the bird is the individual local identifier, which I need to find here. And then random colors seems good, I classify, and I get a different label for each bird, which is also something that we want. They are labeled M, N, O, P, Q. Um, apply and see what happens. It seems good. Let's, uh, let's try to zoom in a little bit. We can see that 
Uh, if we zoom to a very high resolution, we can see them uh, flying side by side. In this case, they seem to follow some landmarks of the railway, but I mean, this is not always the case, but the pigeons do follow landmarks when they fly. And then, uh, this is one way of visualizing the uh, coordinates. The other thing that I wanted to show you is this um, other method of, uh, instead of using a categor categories, using a graduate scale for the colors. And in, in particular, because I have information about the ground speed, I could use this one with uh, for, uh, a few more levels of precision and a color ramp, which I can choose as this one or maybe another one that uh, I, I prefer for some other reason. Let's take this one. I classify and uh, plot the result. Now what we see is that the color should reflect speed and in particular I think a bright color is faster speed. Let's, let's check again, sorry, because I am not sure. So bright color is uh, faster speed uh, within this range. So just from uh, this, we can have a look, and it looks like that they go at a slightly faster speed when they go in a strike direction, while when they change direction, they may change speed. This is just an observation that is not uh, tested, okay? It's just uh, something that I see now. Maybe true or maybe not true. We need to, if we want to investigate this, we would need to uh, check it from the data. But this is a possible project for the future. So this is a, how we can uh, have a, a sort of map of the trajectories of these pigeons at different scales, at the scale of individual birds or at the scale of uh, the whole trajectory of the flock. Now, the next step is not something that I wanted to do with the QGS, but it is about working with R to calculate the speed of these birds. Now, in this data set, the speed was already calculated. So in this case, you don't need to do anything, actually. But it is often the case that you have uh, data points, uh, fixes of the position of an animal at different times, and you don't know the speed at which they move, and you need to calculate it. So typically, when you track an animal, you will have uh, data about the position and the time. So time stamp for each uh, fix and then the position on X and Y coordinates and you could also have a Z coordinate if it is an animal that moves in three dimensions. From one single data point, of course, it's not possible to know the speed because you don't know how fast it was moving and you need more than one data point. But usually you have a trajectory with a few uh, different data points together. So uh, based on the, on the movement between point one and point two, you could define a speed. And let's say that we call this speed as speed two. So we assign this value of speed, the speed in the time immediately before position two to position two, okay? Because uh, the speed is, uh, depends on, is a speed during a path in between two data points. And so we need to decide if we consider this speed associated more to 0.2 or 2.1. In this case, let's call these numbers of speed associated to the uh, last point, to the, late, uh, the latest point following the, following the path. And so you, you have your trajectory, which is defined by the, all these points with time, x and y, and uh, so which define the position and uh, you can measure these values of speed let's focus in particular on the fourth value but whatever you do for one number is the same for the entire process in this case conveniently i, I wrote the coordinates in units of discrete that is behind the data points so you can define point one as the point as uh, with, which has an X position of one and a Y position of one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Okay, and in this case, point four is the point with the X position of 11 and Y position of six. The uh, speed is distance 
divided by time. So we need to calculate the distance between point three, 4 and point 3 divided by the time interval between these two points. How do we calculate the distance given that we have coordinates for uh, easting and northing, that we have coordinates for the movement along x and along y? Well, this is uh, quite easy. You just rely to Py Pythagoras' theorem and you know that the distance on x uh, squared plus the distance on y squared over the square, so taking the square root, will give the, the, the total distance, the absolute distance between these two points. In this case, the, the, the distance along x is 11 minus 7, which gives 4, and the distance along y is uh, 6 minus 3, which gives 3, and we have the total distance as 5. And then you uh, need to divide this 5 by delta t, and the delta t is the difference in time between the timestamp 4 and 3, which is 0.25 units okay you do this calculation you get a value of 20. if your new units for x and y were meters as it's the case in the, uh, in the utm coordinates and the, your units for time are seconds as it is the case for gps uh, coordinates in this particular data set of course uh, the temporal resolution will be different in different data sets uh, but uh, in this case, the, the temporal resolution uh, is in 0.25 seconds, and the units are seconds, so you get the speed in meters per second, which you can convert, if it is more convenient for you, to other units such as kilometers per hour or miles per hour, and so on. And uh, then, once you have done this for one point in the trajectory, you just do it the same for all the points in the trajectory, and you have your speed for any particular time in the trajectory, which you can then, for instance, average to get the average flying speed of these pigeons, which could be something that you want to measure. Using R, we need to uh, decide which kind of steps of analysis we need to perform. First of all, we need to read the data set into R. We probably want to isolate one single bird because we want to analyze the trajectory of that particular bird. Then, once we have, we have isolated one bird, we need to calculate the distance for each time step along the X, along the easting uh, axis, and then the distance traveled along the northing axis along y and then we use Pythagoras theorem to calculate the distance that they have moved we divide by the time interval between two fixes and we get the speed for each uh, particular bird and particular time and if we want to do the same for all the birds we just repeat this loop for all the other birds I have opened our studio with the, all the tabs for the console, the script, which currently has only a script with a comment and nothing in it. There are no variables in memory and uh, the help file is open here. So the first thing that I always add at the beginning of our script, unless I think that it shouldn't be there, is to clear the memory, even if, as I said before here, the memory is already clean. I could just uh, write it or copy from some other uh, file if I know, uh, if, if I want to, uh, because it's always difficult to remember these comments. If I have another file where you have the same comment, you just copy it, clean. Then uh, the next step, we said we want to read the data um, uh, from the file. So before we can read the data, we need to tell R how to find the file, which is the file name and the file path in the computer. We could write it uh, here in uh, creating a variable directly, but what I find convenient is to create a variable file name and uh, let the user choose uh, a particular file name from memory. So with this variable, we ask the user of the script 
to choose a file. So ask a user to choose a file. And uh, this uh, file name will be, be part of a file, can be assigned to a variable, to an object called file name. We can try to run this few lines already. And I go to desktop and get the uh, data set, the, short, the smaller data set with only flight five in it. So now we are, has created a variable file name which gives the full path to the file to the file. And we need to read this information from the file. So I create a variable which I call D and I could use the, the arrow like this or I could use the equal in R is, the two are very similar. And then read table and I need to say that I want to read the, the table in file name and I can have some other uh, information. For instance, I know that there is a header. So I, I write header equal true. And then I know that the separator is a comma, even if in this case it doesn't, I mean, it should be the default value, I think. But let's try. And now I have read in memory a huge variable D with all this information about ID, whether it was visible, the timestamp, the longitude, latitude, and all these things together. So I, I read the file in name, uh, the file. If, in this case, I read the file with just a few flights, not all the flights, but if I were, were to uh, just subset and work on a single flight while reading the very large file with all the, I think it was 10, or, well, with all the flights in this experiment, I could make use of the function subset that is open here in the help, which lets me subset a number of elements from, uh, uh, for instance, a data frame like this. In this case, for instance, I could, chase that I, I could choose that I want to create a smaller data set, which is a subset of D, hmm, for which the... Uh, so, let, let's, be, let's go back one step. In the data frame D, I have all this information, all these columns, and I can also ask R to tell me which the header columns are by writing names D, which I run now, and I get this list. So what was important for us was the comments section, because that is information about the flight. So if I subset D saying that I want comment, comments to be equal, and this is why I use the double equal, because I want to check if they are equal, not to assign a, a variable or, or a number to a variable, I want to check if they are equal. So I say comments, I'm sorry, comments with an S, equal, in this case, homing flight 5. Hmm? So this would be a way to subset only the fifth flight. In this case, I only uh, chose or read, I've already done this in a sense, so I only have only flight five here. So if I subset, I get a new variable data n, and we can see here that the two are exactly the same size. They are uh, identical because I didn't really need to subset for only flight five. So let's forget about this line for the moment. Oh, sorry. Let's forget about this line for the moment and uh, think about something else that we need to do. We said that we want to actually subset again, but for each bird, because we want to calculate the speed of a particular bird. Mm. In this case, names D was telling us that, uh, um, the, so we know that the bird is, the, is given by the individual local identifier. And I could ask for, uh, the column individual local identifier and I see that these are numbers and letters with a, in this case it, it only shows the first few lines and I have an N but it will be a different label for other birds. 
So there is a function in R that lets me know all the values that I can find for one column, which is the function unique. unique. So I could have the bird ID for all birds, but like I call, I call this variable bird IDs, by asking all the unique values of the individual local identifier. So if I, if I run this line, I get this bird IDs in memory. Let's print this by running it again like this. And I see that there are a few birds, N, P, Q, R, S, T, U, O, and M. These are the labels for each bird. Knowing all the unique labels that I have is useful because I could then uh, choose to subset for one particular bird. For instance, data selected individual equal to subset. I want to subset my data set D uh, on the criterion that individual a local identifier must be equal to, for instance, n or something like this. Let's try with this. I run this line and I have now a smaller subset of just 2,845 observations, which probably corresponds to one single bird and the bird n. I could check by uh, further uh, looking what is inside this uh, new data set, okay? But for the moment, I, I mean, I know, I know that it works. You can, you can check on your own. What I, uh, instead of using N, um, which I have to know by reading here, I co could also uh, check directly based on bird IDs. So bird IDs, I remind you, is this um, list of letters, N, P, Q, R, S, T. And I can access each individual of them with the brackets. For instance, the first bird ID would be bird IDs of 1, which is n. The second one would be bird IDs of 2, which would be p. So this is convenient because instead of saying that I want n, I could just say that I want bird IDs of 1. And so this is the first individual. Okay. So I, I close this. Now, I'm, uh, to this point, I've selected one single individual and uh, in a smaller data set, for which I can, again, I know that it has the same header as the, as the previous bigger data set. Okay? The header is the same, it's just that in this case, when I look at the individual local identifier, it will always be the same bird. But this is convenient, having this smaller data set, because now I can uh, plot these coordinates, but I can also uh, try to calculate the speed. It's always useful to plot the data when you have data, and in this case we can use a, a ggplot, uh, for instance. I, I call the library ggplot2, and, uh, I can, or I could use basic R plotting uh, capabilities, okay? Let, let's do first with the basic R, which is quicker, okay? Plot, I want to uh, plot the data for the se selected individual, and with the dollar access, I access as a particular column, which is the UTM easting. And then uh, the same data selected individual, and then uh, with the dollar I select, in this case, the UTM uh, northing. So I'm choosing X and Y for my birth. I, I can specify, this is a, a basic R, I can specify some parameters, such as that I want to uh, draw a line, and the line width should be three, and then uh, the color should be, I, I don't know, red or something. Let, let's try with this. This is basic R without using ggplot, and I have this uh, plot. 
You see that in this case I, I still haven't worked on the labels and the numbers here are units of meters but they are huge so they are not very convenient for us to uh, look at. So one thing that I can do is try to uh, record the uh, arrival point, which is what I'm doing now, for these trajectories. So I uh, use the function tail in R that gives me the last point of a vector, of an array. And in this case I ask for the last point of the UTM coordinates for the easting. So uh, tail and UTM coordinates easting 1 means that I only take one point. And then I do the same for the northing and get the arrival point for the northing position. This uh, is useful because then I could, for instance, renormalize all the coordinates to this arrival point. So let's have a look at what is in these variables. I just um, copy one of them or run them. And um, we can see that uh, I've now uh, created new variables, UTM easting arrival, which has this value 4832, which corresponds to this point on the left in the map. Um, and let's have a look for the northing. It's also this point at the top uh, left of the map. So, uh, so when I looked at the map, at uh, the trajectory in QGIS, I, I said that the loft was probably at the bottom right position uh, because all the trajectories converge to that point. But it turns out that, in fact, the, the, the loft is more on the north left. So it, it's probable that the authors have cut these trajectories at some point. Let's plot this uh, final point on the map. Uh, again, the, now I'm using basic R rather than ggplot. And you can see that there is now an, an, a dot appearing on the trajectory, which is at the, uh, the top left of the, of, of the map, of the graph. What I can do, uh, once I've calculated this um, uh, arrival point coordinates, is that uh, I could uh, create a new column in my data frame where I uh, record the relative easting, relative to the arrival point. The only purpose of this is so that I have uh, everything in units of meters, but I would have smaller numbers to deal with. So I just uh, subtract the coordinate of the starting point from the uh, whole set of coordinates to get these normalized coordinates shifted uh, around uh, the arrival point so that the arrival point should be now be zero. And I do the same both for easting and for the northing component. Um, yes, so In, in this case, I mean, this is not necessary for all the calculations that we want to do. It's just for the purpose of visualization and to get coordinates that we can uh, visualize and understand better. Okay, now I, I can do the plot again. I copy the code from above. And in this case, I not need to uh, write relative easting and relative northing instead of uh, easting and northing. And le let's see uh, what this gives us. Of course, the, uh, I don't expect anything different from before. The only difference is that in this case, the, um, uh, the, co the coordinates, the units will be uh, centered with the, the arrival point at zero. And here we have the new graph. You can see that now we can easily see that the scale of this flight is uh, 3,000 meters on the north-south axis and uh, 12 kilometers on the east-west axis. Of course, I would need to check the labels and uh, improve the aesthetics of the graph, but this is uh, just for, for checking the data, so it's not for uh, publication or for anything. And now what I'm going to do is that I'm uh, calculating the speed. First of all, I look at the diff. Diff function in R gives me the difference between uh, subsequent element in a vector, for instance. And so uh, and I can, with a lag, in this case, I just look at the difference for each time step, but I could look at the speed over a, smoothed over a longer time scale, for instance. Uh, so I, I look at the difference in uh, 
coordinates for x and for y, for uh, easting and northing, which are how many meters the bird moves from one uh, fix to the next. And then I use uh, the Pythagoras theorem, as I said before, to calculate the total distance traveled between two uh, time points. Hmm? So this is the square root of the distance along x squared plus the distance along y squared. And this gives me the, the distance traveled. I, uh, I, uh, once I have this, I still need to um, normalize, to, to, to calculate speed, I need to consider time, the time between two uh, fixes, which we said before is 0 0.25 seconds in this data set. So I'm now creating a new ca a column for the, for the data frame where I write the calculated speed, which is um, the distance traveled divided by the time uh, between two fixes. Of course, speed calculations are sensitive to the time scale at which you analyze speed because instantaneous speed is different from the speed over a longer path, both because there is some error in the GPS and also because, uh, and also because the, um, um, the pigeon will change direction, change speed. So if I take the, the distance traveled over, say, a minute, uh, that could be less than the, to the actual distance traveled over a, a shorter time scale because the, the path is windy, say. Um, okay, so... Uh, uh, the problem, if I want to put back this speed to the uh, original vector, is that uh, the vector with speed we said before is shorter than the vector with the actual coordinates. So I, I, I use the function c, concatenate, to add uh, not a number for the first data point, because we don't know the speed when the bird was, uh, say, starting. And now I can still use a basic R to uh, plot a histogram, for instance, of this uh, values of speed for one single bird, okay? Um, so the, the label would be speed for uh, x-axis, and I just use my calculated speed. As I said, in this case, the data set already had the value of speed, a nice, nice histogram. We can see that this, the speed has a peak around uh, a little less than 20 meters per second, which is, you could convert to kilometers per hour or mile per hour. You have seen how we can calculate speed from coordinates uh, using R. And uh, for the moment we have done this for one single bird, but you can imagine that it would be relatively easy to extend this and do it for all birds in, in the flock. And uh, something that you may want to learn later on is how to automate this process. So, for instance, adding a for loop, well, a loop that repeats the same operation on all uh, the elements, in this case on all the birds in our flock, so that you can, for instance, calculate the speed for each of them individually. In this case, we are not really interested in this because we know that the birds were flying together, so by, uh, obviously they will be flying at the same speed, but we could still be interested in looking at instantaneous speed and differences in this instantaneous speed, because we know that birds that uh, tend to fly a little bit faster, even for just a few meters, uh, usually tend to uh, become leaders in the, in the group to, to decide of the, the, the uh, to decide of the direction of movement of the whole group. This is uh, something that we can explore in future. For today, I'm happy uh, that you were able to calculate the speed of an animal, which can, of course, be applied not just to GPS coordinates or to flying birds, but could be applied to any set of coordinates uh, coming from different sources. Thank you for today.